Hello, loved ones. How are you doing today? Welcome, new subscribers. Thank you, subscribers, for following, liking, sharing our videos. Thank you for all your support. If you're here for the first time, hit the subscribe button. My name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Today, I wanted to come here and talk about the Arisha. Someone said something about the Arisha in the What is Obea video. They left a comment there, and I said, you know what? I'm going to come here, and I'm going to talk about the Arisha. I never just went into depth about the Arisha. So I thought I would come here and talk about the Arisha today. Now, some of the things that I'm going to be discussing are going to be sensitive to some of the people that are in Santeria or in Lukumi or in Yoruba. Because some of the things are going to go, are not going to mesh with some of your traditions. So if you're not going to, you know, if you don't like it, I advise you right now to, you know, turn this off. Because some of the things I'm going to be talking about are going, you're not going to be, you, you probably haven't heard before. And I know how people get about their religions and their traditions. You know, they, once they get stuck in that, they just don't want to hear anything else. They just want to stick to that. And that's fine. I have nothing against that. But I just wanted to warn you before I start the discussion, some of the things that I'm going to discuss are going to be very sensitive to what you've learned in your religion. All right. And for some of you, this is going to be freeing. This is going to really help you understand the Arishas, who they are, where they come from, what exactly is an Arisha. And those are very reasonable questions for the ones who are very new to this path. And in order to understand Arisha, you have to understand African spirituality. You have to understand African metaphysics and African religion. What really helped me is watching uh, Professor James Small, he really inspired me to go down this path and really start putting things together. And if you're interested in uh, uh, knowing more about Professor James Small, you can follow some of his YouTube videos. Very smart guy. He does a comparison with all the world religions to African, African spirituality. Very cool guy. Uh, so I, I do recommend you watch some of his videos if you're interested in understanding more about the African spiritual systems. Now, this discussion is from my research, from the questions that I asked and the books that I read. You know, so this is from my perspective. All right. So, you don't you can take it or leave it. But I'm also going to give you resources here so you can look at the information that I've studied and you can compare it as well. All right. Because I like I like uh, I like sticking to the facts. I like sticking to history because it, it all has to line up for me. I don't like going by speculation or listening to anyone else. I like seeing the evidence for myself. I love to read and find things out for myself. All right. And that's the way we should be. That's the way we should be. But before I start this discussion, you know, when I begin this discussion, let me re let me say that over. Before I begin the discussion, I'm going to start the discussion from the Yoruba concept of the Orisha, their tradition, how they understand the Orisha. And this is going to make sense as I go on why I'm doing it from the Yoruba perspective first. Uh, this is going to make sense as I go on. All right. Let's go. Let's start. Let's just dive on in here. Yoruba is a divine journey to the inner self and to God consciousness. Yoruba is a religion. Those beings which are Deemed angels by Western definition are known to the to the Yoruba as Orisha. The aspirant is directed to see the Orisha as animations of one source of the Oladumare. The Orishas are not simply mythological constructions designed to satisfy the lower mind intent of humans. As angels, the Orishas were created and sent by the Oladumare to assist in the spiritual evolution of humankind. We're made to evolve. This is all going to make sense as I move on. 
In the Judeo-Christian culture, the word for angel signifies their work as messengers, but other word, words for the angels signify their essence. They are called gods, the sons of gods, ministers, servants, watchers, the holy ones. They constitute the court of heaven. Although Judeo-Christian emphasis is clear, it need be fully realized that the concept of angels existed long before their arrival. The Yoruba concept of ancestors and Orishas as messengers of the Oludumiwe were in effect thousands of years prior to Judeo-Christianity. Native people throughout the world speak of being shown rituals by holy messengers and of being shown how to farm and domesticate animals. Ancient people, now listen up because this is important. This is going to be important as we move on. So make sure you're listening to this statement. Ancient people of all world cultures depict angelic beings as seen through their cultural eyes. I'm going to repeat this. Ancient peoples of all world cultures depict angelic beings as seen through their culture eyes. They were helpers in survival and raising of their nations. The reality of angelic forces is based on faith and conviction. In Yoruba religious system, one must believe in the Orisha in order to ascend to God consciousness. Again, this is about evolving your consciousness. When you look at, you know, if you're really looking at the spiritual system, that's what it's about. It's about evolving the human consciousness in order to reach the divine state of human being because you're re reaching your divinity as you evolve your consciousness. Now, a lot of religions, and this, this let's 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 break down the religion. Because when we break down the religion separately from the Orisha, religion means tradition. It is a tradition created around the Orisha. That's why you have Lakumi, you have Santeria, uh, you have Yoruba. If I haven't already said that, because sometimes I repeat things, um, they are all traditions built around the Orisha. Our ancestors built these calling cards, these rituals to contact, to communicate with the Orishas. And that's why you'll have Santeria saying, oh, we don't do it that way. You know, Santeria said they don't do it like the Lakumi. Lakumi said they don't do it like the Santeria. And they're both right because their ancestors created these traditions, these calling cards, these signatures to communicate with the Orishas. And it was agreed on a by the Orisha that, hey, our ancestors are going to communicate with the Orishas this way. We're going to come up with these rituals. We're going to do it this way. All right. So know the difference in between the two. But basically, the angelic beings, angels, the Orisha, they are not religious. It was men that come up with these traditions to help them communicate and better understand the Orishas. All right. So be able to separate the two. I thought I should, you know, bring that in there so you could really understand the difference between the Orisha and the tradition. All right. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that you don't have to be in a tradition to communicate with the Orisha. And I know some of you people from Santeria and Lakumi and Yoruba saying, oh, how dare you? Oh, my God. No, she didn't say it. She didn't say it. Yes, I did. I did say it. I did say it. All right. I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. I know I've ticked some of you people off and I'm, I, you know, not meaning to. I'm just, I can do nothing but bring the facts. All right. Now, let's look at the word Arisha and where it comes from. The word Orisha is related to several other Yoruba words referring to the head. So Orisha is a Yoruba term. And that's important, so keep that in mind as we move on. The main one, Ori, refers to the physical top of the person's head. Alright? This visible Ori 
However, serves as a vessel for the invisible Ori, the Ori Anu, the internal head, the indwelling spirit of the person. And the kernel of the individual's personality. The Ori Anu exists before the birth. It comes, it comes from God and determines an individual's character and fate. Just as the physical physical head perches on top of the body, the Ori Anu stands over and rules and guides and controls a person's action. So what is the Ori Anu? The Ori Anu is the spiritual intuition. It is a higher self. It is a higher power. It, can, it is your guardian angel. With the recent terms we can use today. That is what the Ori is when you look at the definition of it. So the terms that we would describe today, it would be our intuition, it would be our higher self, it would be our higher power, it would be our guardian angel. That's basically what the Ori is. Alright, so let's go in, you know, uh, the Orisha. An Orisha may be said to be a deity, yet defining the Orisha as a deity does not do it justice to the concept in large part because the term deity often suggests a sort of anthropomorphic supernatural entity. An Orisha may be said to arise when a divine power to command and make things happen converges with a natural force, a deified ancestor, and an object that witnesses and supports the convergence and alignment. An Orisha, therefore, is a, is a complex, multidimensional unity linking people, objects, and powers. So what is a, a Orisha? So, and I'm going to break that down. I love this about African spiritual system, African religion, because our ancestors were able to synchronize Voodoo and the Orisha right under uh, uh, Voodoo and Santeria right up on the Catholicism. It was able to hide. They was able to synchronize it. Even with Christianity, you see that with Hoodoo as well. It was able to evolve. So it doesn't have to stay the same. It can evolve. It can be synchronized. It can change. Alright, so that's what Orisha is. It's an energy that can't evolve. It can converge. It can change. It's an ashe. It's energy that's within nature, that's all around us as well. It's a power. Alright, so it is understood that the Orishas wear many masks. In order for people to better understand them, each Orisha has its own distinct personality and has a wide variety of strengths, weaknesses, and interests. In many ways, therefore, understanding an Orisha is like understanding another human being. In Western African religions and in traditions that have been influenced by them, primordial divinities are those that existed long before the creation of the world, as it is now known. Some of these Orishas are primordial in the sense that they existed before the creation of human beings. They animated directly from God without any human aid. They are Aura, Oran, people of heaven. All right. Now, the history of angels and spirit guides can be traced first to the ancient mysteries of Egypt, Sumerian, Babylonian. Persian cultures, Aset, mother of Horus and wife of Asar, is depicted as a manifestation of an angel. All right. The Orishas are prime mortal gods that came here long ago as the Anunnaki. I know a lot of you people did not know that. I know you're saying, oh, really? That can't be. Yeah. It, and I'm going to show you the links here in a minute. And I know the New Age is telling you, oh, the Anunnaki is alien. They're, they're aliens. They come from here. They come from there. Stay away from the New Age. Our ancestors got so... They, they wrote this down. There's so much information out there. You don't have to go outside of the scope of what your ancestors... You know, the, the information your ancestors have left for you. Because if you're following New Age, not, uh, some of that stuff is not even based in fact. It's just fallacy and propaganda and fantasy that they've made up. So, you've heard it here. The Anunnaki. Alright? The Anunnaki were 
are the Orisha. They're one and the same. Orishas are spin off from the Anunnaki. This is all going to make sense as I move on. All right. The Orisha are the primordial gods that came here long ago as the Anunnaki, which means those who came to earth from heaven. Is the Akkadian term referring to the same group of beings? Anunnaki are said to be the only known group of extra extraterrestrial throughout history to visit earth and leave records of their visitation and even credit themselves with creation of humans and the oldest cities and architecture. All right, so we, this is the same story we hear about the angels as well. We heard the same thing about the Orishas as well, and we're hearing the same thing about the Anunnaki. The Neturu is the term used by the inhabitants of Hemta to refer to Anunnaki. So here we're tying in the Neturu to the Anunnaki. All right, so now we've linked the Orishas to the Anunnaki and the Anunnaki to the Neturu. All of them are one and the same. See, I bet, I bet you didn't know that. I bet you didn't know that. And I, you know, it, it knocked me off my feet too to see the links. But the links are there. But but to more, to be more specific, the Neturu were mostly of Inky's lineage. Inky was known to them as... Pata. All right, so you're saying Inky is known as Pata. You're saying this Anunnaki is also the Anunnaki Inky is also known as the Pata. All right, the Anunnaki are the Elohim. They are not Nephilim. You know, don't believe the propaganda and the hype that New Age is pushing. They are not Nephilim. So are the angels are called different aspects. The angel uh, 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 aspects of God, so does the Orisha. See the pattern here? Answers are in plain sight. So you see all of them are aspects of God. They may be called Elohim by different the Anaki is called Elohim, and I think some of the uh, the European angels are called Elohim, too. You know, I have to look back at that to really piece that together, but I, I've seen that somewhere in there uh, describing some of the European angels. But there's a pattern here with all of them. All of them are being described as aspect animations of God. All right? Anunnaki, Orishas, Lords, and the Neturu are primordial beings or energy which has undergone transformation. There is a connection with all of them. Scientific and archaeological evidence show that Yoruba people are connected to the Egyptians. Many say that the Yoruba people religion is influenced by Kemet or vice versa. This information indicates that the Orisha and the Neturu could perhaps be the same. Many cultures built new deities on top of the old Pantheon. My guess as they evolved, so did their spirituality. You're going to see that. So you're saying, and this is going to make sense as I move on. I know some of you said, no, no way, no way, yes way. This way and I'm going to show you this as I move on but I'm going to woe you some more I'm going to bring you some more woes and you wows so hold on to your seats we're going to go back even further all of the gods Anunnaki, Orisha, Neturu and the Lords come from Mommy Watson. And I know y'all saying, no way. No way. No way can all these deities come from Mama Water. Hold on. I'm going to take, give me a minute because I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how they come from her. All right. And see these links. I, I haven't seen anything like this being linking things together like this. 
So, you know, hold on. Hold on to your socks, and I'm going to give you some resources, too, so you can look this stuff up on your own. Mommy Wata, the story of New Reeds, and this is the Egyptian story. This is an ancient Egyptian story. All right, so let's dive in here. Mama Wata, the story of New Reeds, before anything existed, there was a vast, stagnant, primordial ocean, or a new. Out of new rose the first hill, the eye of Ra Atman. Atum. The first sun, God creator, rose on this hill. He was androgynous and all-powerful. All right, so they're saying that 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 new, and this is in ancient Egypt. They're saying this 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 was this androgynous being that rose up out the water, and. He was the God creator. And what's interesting about this is they call him androgynous. So what is what are we looking at right here? We're looking at the patriarch story of God, of their male deity. Why are they saying he's androgynous? All right. Why are they saying that he's androgynous? Because this this by saying that he's androgynous is giving us clues that. The first God was a woman. Why is this being why is this being said here? But let's look at the second story here. There's an older story that's older than new. That says Mamu. Mamu, you got new and Mamu, in which Mamu makes sense because we have Mammy Water. Pay attention to these suffixes and prefixes because they're they mean something and they link they link things together. So when you're doing your research and you see some of these prefixes and suffixes that match, nine times out of ten, they're talking about the same thing, but they're being called, they're being pronounced different in certain cultures. I hope that made sense to you. Mamu original home was the cosmic mountain beneath the watery abyss. The mountain became the earth. Now let's stop here because I have to talk about because all of this, all of these is, is, is originating from ancient Egypt, these stories here. And ancient Egypt was called, you know, so many different things before it was Egypt. It was Kemet. It was, uh, I think it was called Nubia, Nubian. Uh, you know, it was called so many other different names. All right. Once you do the research on how many uh, names Africa has had, how many names Egypt has had, You'll come to understand that. And then also help your research and finding out this information as well. So you'll have to go really, really deep into finding out what I'm talking about here. But I'll give you some information that'll help you out as well. There are there were 700 gods and goddesses, and many were combined to create new deities. That's why I said. You know, the African religion, the African concepts, they can morph, they can change, they can be synchronized, they evolve. That's what African spirituality is, that nothing was made to be the same. Just like our consciousness evolved, so do our spirituality evolve. All right, so keep that in mind. There are There was hierarchy of gods of Amun-Ra, the sun god, and Isis often juggled this supreme position. Now, a lot of Afrocentrics are not going to talk about that. Uh, a little bit of the discussion was in destruction of black civilization, which led me to look at the spiritual history of women. Because it was it what the the Afrocentric men were not talking a lot about the spiritual history of women. They would say the black woman was God, but they would not go into depth. But there was some civil disputes in Lower and Upper Egypt. That's why it was a divide. And you can always tell who was from Lower and Upper Egypt by the headdress. Upper Egypt wore the headdress that pointed up like a hat. And the Lower Egypt wore the headdress that more was like a wrap or a scarf that went down. That's how you can tell the difference between Lower and Upper Egypt. Not only were they having political disputes, they were also having spiritual religious disputes as well. And as you know, many of the pharaohs got their royalty through those ancestral mothers there in Egypt, Kemet. 
All right, so there was some gender power struggles going on there, and that's where the first split took place. That's where the first confrontation between man and woman took place. See, a lot of people, a lot of Afrocentrics don't go into that, and that's for a good reason. So it's important for you to understand, too, why a lot of information has been lost. Why, you know, why it's here and there. All right, so I thought I would come in and inject that to help you really understand what's going on here. The Divine Mother was worshipped. Self-created goddess who changed gender at will and gave birth to all masculine solar deities. So, contrary to what you may believe, and see, this is why they can't keep ISIS out. They can't keep the Virgin Mary out of their religions because these women gave birth. Again, you have the woman giving royalty, giving position to the man. They must come from this Holy Mother. They must come from this goddess. She has to give birth to them. And if you look at science, you know, science says that all life comes from water. All life comes from water. The sun even came from the water. You have the earth coming from the water. You look at your Bible, it said the water was at the form, uh, without form, and God breathed upon the waters. He breathed upon the waters. Okay, so when the first creation, there was water. So you see evidence of, of that all around, but we don't pay attention to it. It's in plain sight. It's in plain sight. All right. So creation and everything came from water first. That's why water is so important. Water, humans are made up of, of much of water. All right. So you have this refined water that contains this melanin. That everything is made out of. I talked about that in my video when I went on a shamanic journey to the Orishas and I learned all of this stuff. Alright? So let's move on here. The Divine Mother was worshipped as the self-created goddess who changed gender at will and gave birth to all the masculine solar deities. Miami is said to be the creatress of humans known as the black-headed people. So you, you're seeing Miami. Alright? She's being responsible for the first dark-skinned people. Alright? In order to understand the Orisha, in order to stand, understand the Anunnaki, in order to understand all these deities or these animations of God, you have to first understand where they came from. Now, Miami mother was called Miami Namu, the great goddess of the primeval sea, and one who gave birth to heaven and earth. All right, again, we're coming from this water. Everything is being created from this water. And we all we also can see these primordial uh, waters when women are giving birth uh, to their children. They're still... In this water, they're in water. Your water breaks, and then you have your baby. So you can see uh, parts of this, this this scientific evolution is still going on right now today. All right, and we can also go back to our Bible too. When you're hearing in there, let us make man in our image. Now, if man is the first human, who is the us? Who is the us? That, that indicate that there were prime mortal women there creating man. Man is made in the image of woman. Man have breasts that he will not use. He cannot biologically, scientifically give birth to a child, but he has an outverted vagina that's called a penis. So man is made in the image of woman. All right, so you'll see that, and I thought that passage was very interesting in the Bible, for those of you familiar with the Bible, when that passage said, let us make man in our image. If it's just God, who is us? So I ask myself these questions. It's important to be objective and ask ourselves questions as we are reading these materials. You know, I'm hungry, so I'm always asking questions. I don't want to know why. Why has that been said? But what is this and what does that happen? Be inquisitive because that's a true seeker, okay? 
And this is Miami Namu. To the ancient Egyptians, she was known as Ren, meaning born from the place of fishes. And I know you see this image and you say, oh, that's the Anunnaki, that's the alien. No, no. Again, let's stick to the scientific facts. All right, we're not going to go out into space. We're going to stay right here on Earth. All right, so this is Ren. Born, meaning born from the places of fishes. Remember, she comes from water. She's the first primordial being that comes out the water. She gave birth to Mami Wati, Mami Namu. She is the first primordial mo mother. All right? And her son is Horus. Again, she's giving validation. She's giving royalty. She's giving birth to the first man. And he's called Renu. Which means unnamed serpent child. Now you see this guy. He's dressed up in his fish. And I know you guys have seen this probably in some other documentary. Or somewhere else. But you see seeing this guy dressed up in his fish attire. This is Renu. This is Renu. Signifying that he's coming from the primordial mother Ren. Now, you can find some of this stuff in ancient Egypt, ancient now, because Egypt was called many things before it was called Egypt. So you're going to have to go back further. And most of the things that you're finding on Egypt now is, you know, from the past, maybe two or three thousand years. But you're going to have to go back further to find this information. This is Ren. All right. So you take a close look at that. Now, history suggests that the current patriarchal religious systems are merely overlays of the ancient sacerdotal order in ancient Egypt. Uti, or Wati, because it's spelled in the, the Egyptian spell, Wati, U-A-T-I was called Isis, the oldest of palliation. And was the first Miami goddess worshipped by the Egyptians as the Holy Widow, the Gentrix. The self-creator, the one who reigned alone in the beginning, the one who brings forth the gods. She brings forth the gods. That's why you're going to see this. That's why this, this birth of Jesus is so important, this holy virgin. You know, you're seeing another depiction of Mommy Wata. So you don't know that. You can also see uh, Mommy Water 2 on the Starbucks logo. That's her as well. See, she's hidden in plain sight everywhere. You're going to see her too as Isis. Giving for, giving, cre created the first man. All right? See, they can't keep her out. They can't keep her out. You know, the patriarchs are building their religion, but... It doesn't have any validation without the God mother, the mother God. It has no validation, so they have to add her in there. No matter which religion that you're into, you're looking at, they're going to be coming from this divine mother. There's a pattern in here. If you, if you look at the patterns, they're in there. All right? And there's a common thread, and this is all going to make sense as I go on. We have Isis originally wor uh, worshipped as Mama Uati in ancient Egypt and as Mommy Ati Aruru in ancient Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. The history of priesthood of Mama Wata is overwhelmingly matriarchal, meaning that Mommy Watas are part of the old African matriarchal sacerdotal religious systems that once ruled and dominated Africa and many parts of the ancient world for thousands of years. The African gods made up, are made up of two interconnected parts, the lower gods of the earth and the underworld, because that's what the, the that's what the laws are. They're more ancestral. All right, but this is going to make sense as I go on. And then you have the Arisha, gods of sky and heaven. All right. That's what that is.
Now, if you're interested in, in finding out more about this information, I, you know, and I did a, a, a book review on the syllables, The First Prophecies of Mama Wati, The Theft of the African Prophecies by the Catholic Church by Mama Zogby. I did a book review on that if you're interested in, in, interested in the book review, but this is a must-have book that you have to have in your library because this is where you're going to find most of your ancient knowledge of Egypt and their gods and the spiritual practices of women you're going to find and it doesn't make sense and i tell you what the history of religion doesn't make sense without this knowledge because i was just like okay they keep saying the the the, the spirituality come from the women and the black woman is god but you know one nobody's going into death and it's not till i got this book and start reading this book everything just was like it came together it made so much sense once i read this book so you know i recommend you get the book it is a must have it is priceless if you're trying to uh, piece things together and make sense of things this thing you know this book links everything together it will tell you why these religions have a common thread really good book now well, as i went on and did my study i was like okay all right well, you know, well, how old is Ifa? Because I know the older it is, the more authentic it's going to be. And so what I start looking at is the ages of most of these spiritual systems or these religions. How old are they? When were they born? Where they come from? Because see, when we see how old they are, we can tell where they come from, where they originated from. All right, because they, they had to originate from somewhere. All right. So when I got to looking at Ifa, I said, how old is Ifa? Let me see how old is Ifa. Well, the practice of Ifa originated as far back as 8,000 years ago. Therefore, Ifa may indeed be the oldest monotheistic religion in the world. Ifa is said, and see, this is a contradictory. This is a contradictory here, even this, by them saying this, okay? Because it goes on and says, if Ifa is said to be a sort, Ifa is said to be a sort of spiritual system from Voodoo. Did you know that? Ifa comes from Voodoo. Now, this is my speculation that uh, Ifa was created by the patriarchs coming out of Voodoo, trying to preserve that spiritual system from voodoo then they synchronized it and if you look at ifa it's kind of ran by the men you do have women um priestess in there or spiritual advisors in there but for the most part ifa was kind of created by the men that's when the patriarchs start going into a a mono, monotheistic uh direction all right, so that's just my speculation that Ifa was uh, created by these men, basically. All right, but when you look in Ifa as well, you will see Mama Wata in there as well when you're looking at that. When you're looking at the Orisha, but I'll go on with that a little later. Uh, this will all make sense as I move on. But Ifa comes from Voodoo. And that's why I said Ifa, the Orisha, they're all one in the same. They all, once you get them together and compare them, line them up, you see they all come from the same origin. That's why there's so many, you know, uh, similarities. And, and the pattern kind of goes the same because they come from the same origin. They come from our ancestral mothers. They created these spiritual systems. Okay? Now let's look at Voodoo. You know, and this is Mama Wati. You know, Voodoo is first originated from Mommy Wati. Mommy Wata. You get, that's where it originates from. Voodoo has been estimated to have existed for more than 10,000 years plus. So it's older than Ifa. It's older than Ifa. Ifa is a spin off from Voodoo. 
You're hearing it here now, people. You're hearing it here. Now, I know a lot of this stuff is, is, is too much for you guys. You don't want to hear it. You're just like, this can't be true. You know, do the research for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. Do your own research. You know, I encourage you to do your own research. Having its roots in ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, East Africa, India, Asia Minor, ancient Turkey, ancient Crete, Thessalonica, ancient Israel, and in ancient afro metronio Aniona, later known as Greece. So Greece was known as Aniona before it was Greece. And that's why, too, you can find so many people of color when they go back further and further. There's people of color there because our ancestral mothers set up temples and spiritual systems there in those locations. That's why you see a common thread among spiritual system and religions in most of those places because our ancestral mothers set them up. Okay? And I know people saying, oh, they're not connected and nah, 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 nah. But when you start looking at the spiritual history of women, you start finding the connection and the pattern. It's not going to make sense until you start doing that. It was in all these locations where African queen mothers established their powerful temples and theocratic empires. All right. And I got this from this book, you know, Mama Wati, African Ancient Goddess Unveil, Volume 2, Reclaiming the Ancient Mommy Wata Voodoo History and Heritage of Diaspora by Mama Zogby. Another good book. This book is made about 500 page, pages packed with, I mean, packed with information. I mean, she goes over all the world religions and showing you where these ancestral mothers set up this and migrated and migrated all over the world. She's showing you this. All right. Very good book. Recommend it. It is a must-have in your library if you want to put all these things together and really understand these deities and, and these uh, spiritual concepts. You have to get these books. You know, I recommend it. You know, you do yourself a disservice if you don't have it. And I'm telling you, nothing about what I was reading made sense about the history of African history made sense until I got these books and really looked at why the black woman was God. Why is this being said and why they're not going into depth? All right. Things will make so much more sense once you uh, you research that. Vudun is an African ancestral religion practiced today largely in West Africa, Africa, Haiti, and throughout diaspora. It's focused on honoring of specialized deities typically born to Africans and honor along with their ancient and recent ancestors through specific rituals, prayers, evocations, celebrations on a basic level. These deities are often described and symbolized as forces of nature and are honored with specific rites unique to their own element. Voodoo and other African religions was one of the major African ancestral religions practiced throughout the world. So Voodoo was practiced just like Christianity. And I can remember being a kid looking in the Old Testament and looking at some of those rituals and saying to myself, this sounds like voodoo. You know, even though I didn't know that much about voodoo, I just knew a lot of propaganda. But what I was reading in there looked like voodoo. And I was like, wow. But why they talk about voodoo and they talk about this stuff, but it's right here in this Bible. But see, nobody just really pays attention to it. And I even wonder myself, how did I know that as a kid? How did I know that that was voodoo? But I guess it's you know my intuition, those, those ancestors, because we carried them with us. I guess even then they were speaking to me. All right, because the information is all is out there. So voodoo was just as popular as Christianity in the ancient world. You got to remember these temples was all over the world. And and and, and remember, it says that the Orisha energy can be synchronized with the ancestors. This is why ancestors are so important because a lot of them are synchronized and linked to some of these deities.
This is why honoring the ancestors first is so important before you go on to work with the Orisha. Because some of your ancestors may be already synchronized with them. And when you start honoring your ancestors, they will lead you to whether you need to go through Voodoo or you need to go to the Orisha first. Or sometimes you might practice it all. That's why you have the Obeya. Now, Obeya is an ashe too that is popular in Voodoo because when you look at Voodoo, you're going to be seeing many of the Orisha deities in there as well. That's why I said Obeya is in that o o uh, Voodoo paradigm. It's very ancient and old, just like uh, Voodoo. And most of these tradition in Obeya is passed down through the family. Most of this spiritual knowledge is passed on. This ashe, this energy. All right? Okay, let's move on. Now, let's look at uh, Yimiya, Ushun, Oya. Who are they? You know, they are the three faces of Mama Wata. You know, I bet you never looked at it like that before, but that's who they are. Because they're connected to the water again. And what Ifa did and what Yoruba religion did is separated the three faces of Bama Wata. See, they can't have a religion without her because she's the mother God. She's the creatress. She created all of this. So what they did is separated the aspects of her. And again, African spirituality can be synchronized. It can evolve. And that's what happened here. It's just as effective. It's just as effective. Okay, so you have Yimiya. You, she's the mother of the ocean, the sea. Then you have Oshun, mother of sweet water. Then you have Oya, oh, still connected to storms, water, again. All right, so these are the three faces of Mama Water. All right, I'm going I'm to I'm get in here deeper now. Stay with me. This is interesting as well because uh, when I was reading Mama Wata, uh, Goddess Unveil, I saw Kali in the Voodoo and Pantheon, and that just blew me away. But Kali and Oya are one and the same. When you're looking at Oya, you're looking at Kali because Oya is the destroyer. She cleans house. She watches over the ancestors. All right, if you got a problem, you're trying to clean your house, you're trying to get something done fast, you call on oil, you call on Cali, they do the same thing. If somebody has wronged you, you can call on Cali or oil, and they, they get right on in there and they take care of that. So when you look in that oil, you look in that at, at Cali, and Cali itself means black. Our ancestral mother set up that spiritual system along with Shiva as well. Okay, so when you're looking at Cali, you're looking at Oya as well. See, all these spiritual systems are connected. And if you get uh, deeper into the Mama, uh, Mami Wata, Pathanon, you're going to see Cali come up in there. You might see Oya come up in there, but Cali and Oya are one and the same. Okay, so you're seeing that. You see Callie with this sword. You can barely see the sword, but she has this sword in her hand. And she's destroying her enemy. She's the great destroyer. And then you have Oya. She has this hook-looking uh, sword in her hand. She's also called the great destroyer, uh, too. And she has another aspect where she's over the ancestors. All right, so look at the similarities here. Look at that. They're there. Hidden in plain sight. Now let's look at the other aspects of Mama Wati. All right? Because Mama Wati is also a destroyer. Uh, she's the creatress. Uh, she's also the mother of all. So you seeing Yimiya. Going to talk about Yimiya right now. Yimiya or Yimaya right here is, is, is a perfect aspect of Mama Wati because they got her as a mermaid and that's why you're gonna see mommy wati is is the symbol of the mermaid she comes from the water so you have mommy wati uh mama wati on the left and you have yamaya on the right see the similarities again yamaya uh, yamaya is another face of mama wata all right it's been synchronized it's been changed all right so you can't you can't they personified it more all right. Now look at the similarities. 
and Yamaya and Mama Wata, they are so closely synchronized. I mean, when you look at Yamaya, look at the uh, the the characteristics and and the strengths and weakness of Yamaya. She has a lot of of Mama Wata characteristics, so they didn't do a lot of changing when they created Yemiya or Yamaya. Or Yamoja. Some of you know her as Yamoja. Okay, let's move on to Oshun. Again, I like this picture again because we associated Oshun with water. Again, this is another aspect of, of Mama Wata because she is the neutral. She is connected to sexuality. She is connected with prosperity. She's the mother of sweet waters, a blessing. So here, Oshun is another aspect of Mommy Wata. All right, so take a good look at that. Now, what many take literal is actually scientific explanation for Earth and humans. So when we're looking at the Orishas and we're looking at our ancestors tell these stories of creations, there really was no word for science. So what they did is personify these deities, giving us a scientific explanation for nature, you know, they were given this is this is because there, there was no scientific terms there so what they did is they used these stories to explain nature as well these energies are given names to help us understand the function but over time these functions evolve as we evolve now, now i'm not saying that these energies don't have the capability to materialize because I've seen angels with my own eyes. Yes, they have the capabilities to materialize. But they also are around us as well. They also can be found in nature. They also can be found in our consciousness as well. These deities live in our consciousness as well because they are a part of our ancestors as well. All right. And so how do we tap into them? Well, we tap into them by doing the character work, by mastering self, by evolving the consciousness we are getting in contact with the orisha with the netaru with the anaki as we consciously evolve all right because we got to remember too they are a part of our ancestors they do live in our consciousness we do carry those cosmogenetic links all right because the aboriginal the african person is the original human we have those human dna markers that connects us with natures and then you have the neanderthals but the humans have these genetic marches markers that connect us with earth that connect us with the cosmos all right so we have these cosmogenetic links to our ancestors and to these deities as well i hope this in uh this this video was very insightful and information and really helped you understand really who the Orisha was. I know for some of you, you're in awe right now because you can't believe that this could be all linked together. And some of you are probably not, not going to accept it, but that's fine too. I'm just presenting to you what I've learned and what I've researched. And I try to stick to the facts. But I thank you so much for being here today. Light and love, may the ancestors be with you.